206, as we all stand together. M206, oh say, but I am glad. There is a song in my heart today, something I never had on that first verse there together. As you find M206.
Amen. Amen. You be seated, will you please? Uh, we need to take some opera classes to sing that song. That's a big one. And uh, I'm glad that you're here. I hope you've had a good week. If you've had a good week, say amen. amen. If you had a bad one, say amen anyway. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And uh, God is doing a great uh, work for us. And uh, we're thrilled about that. And uh, always, uh, I love Thursday night meeting. I love to be with you. I love to open the word of God, allow the Lord to speak to us. And uh, it also means that Friday is the day off and the school week's over. And so it's just a good day. It's a, it's a celebration. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, what God has for us on the weekend. And uh, we're thrilled about that. So please remember on Saturday is our soul winning effort at uh, 10 o'clock. So if you can help us there, we'd appreciate it. And I know some of you took Bibles with you and uh, prepared the bags for us, and we greatly appreciate that. And uh, that's proof that will abound to your account as well. So if you brought those in, they're going out uh, on Saturday. We're excited about that, and so please uh, please remember that. And then, of course, it's Mother's Day, uh, fellas. It's Mother's Day coming up this Sunday, so you, you want to make sure you don't forget that. Um, I was reminded of uh, two years ago, my wife wanted a, a hammock on our balcony. And so they, they sell this hammock stand. And uh, so you buy the hammock and then you buy the stand and, and all that. So she tried it out for a while and she went inside and I tried it out for a while. And then she came outside and she got in it with me. And I thought, boy, this, you know, uh, we're pressing the limits here. Not that she was on it, but that I was on it with her. And then Mariah said, can we join you on the hammock? And, oh, I don't know about that. Well, Mariah gets on the hammock stand. You know what happened. It broke. And it, the whole bar came crashing and hit Marie, gave her a black eye on Mother's Day, and almost knocked her out. And I thought, have mercy on my soul. Can you imagine uh, treating the mother of your children that way? I just can't imagine that. I just can't imagine that. So... Uh, Buy something that won't break or be life-threatening to her, okay? <laughs> and that'll be good. I have another joke I'm thinking about right now, but I just rehearsed it at dinner last night, and I better not tell it. So I'm not going to tell that one right now. <laughs> something, something about something in the driveway uh, going from zero to 200 in three seconds. And I'm not, I'm not going to go there. You know what joke I'm talking about. So it's Mother's Day. We're excited about that. <laughs> Brother Dave told me a joke one time. You know, some people can't tell jokes. How many of you are like that? You just can't tell a joke. I know. I, I miss the punchline, or I give the punchline away before I finish the joke and all that. So Dave was telling me about a, a joke teller's club he was a part of. They get together and tell jokes all the time. Got to the point where they memorized one another's jokes. They laughed anyway. So one of them had a great idea. Said, well, just number them. So instead of telling the joke, we'll just throw the number out there, think about the joke that accompanied the number, and we'll laugh about it. So they got together, and one stood up and said, 34. Boy, they just busted out laughing. And one said, 28, 28, and they started laughing. I stood up and said, 17. Nobody said a word. Nobody laughed or anything. I sat down and said, well, some people can tell them and some can't. And that's about, that's about the way it is. Uh, so anyway, I told one joke on Sunday and somebody's threatened to give me a whole box of uh, comedy bits and all that kind of stuff and so see if I can some, get some new material but anyway Mother's Day is coming up on Sunday regular service times uh, morning and evening and uh, looking forward to that and uh, all the way through let's just press through and be faithful and uh, we're in the transitionary period in our area and uh, most of our seasonal folks have left and uh, and summer's almost setting in, and so it's just a good time to be faithful and bear down on some things and, and be uh, just everlastingly faithful to the Lord. And I appreciate your faithfulness in being here tonight. I know that there are uh, some folks watching at home tonight, and we're grateful that they're joining us. Some out of town, some not feeling well, and so we're always missing those who can't join us. But we're glad that you're here, and uh, we want the Lord to do something great in your heart in your life tonight. Let's stand together, may we? And uh, sing that old chorus that says, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. And we're join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. Sing it with me, will you please? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus and 
as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Now we're thrilled you're here, and I know that you're glad to see one another tonight. And so as they play it through, will you greet someone uh, maybe near and maybe far? But make sure you greet someone, let them know you're glad to see them here. Grateful that you're here tonight. God bless you. seated. We'll receive an offering here in, uh, in just a moment. Um, pray for Miss Alice Lee. She had surgery on Tuesday, doing well. I saw her today and rejoicing in a good, uh, good result there for her. So I uh, remember her in prayer. And uh, Myrna sent me Texas uh, on the way to a church that her and Mr. Willis weren't feeling well. So we want to remember them. And Brother Robert wanted uh, me to let you know he and Miss Nancy are in the Bahamas for a couple days. I don't know if that was a brag or a report. And so uh, I told him, I said, you know, you've created the expectation of faithfulness, so if you didn't tell us where you were, we'd be concerned. And I like that. I like that. And uh, many of you, many of you are just like that. And if we didn't hear from you, we send out the CBI, <laughs> Christian Bureau of Investigation. And... Uh, that's good. If you see somebody that's not here, uh, you know, don't assume necessarily that, uh, well, somebody else will check on them and pastor will check on them and, and all that kind of thing. And um, we were going back through on our Sunday school list and there, uh, there was a few couples who have missed a few weeks. And so just trying to be a blessing and encouragement. And you never know what that word might do in season to be an encouragement and a blessing. And uh, thank the Lord for Many people along the way have encouraged us 
uh, to stay faithful, and I know that uh, many of you are hard at work in that area. Did you get the lesson guide? Brother Jeremy has it for you, and uh, very good. Brother Greg needs one, and uh, that'll be just great. Amen, just great. Well, we'll receive the offering here tonight, and uh, let's be faithful in our giving. I remind you now that our missionary family has grown to 26, and uh, that means that there's 26 uh, men of God and their families who are praying, Lord, Lord, please help our churches to be faithful to give. And uh, if you're not in on this work of missions, I pray that you'll do that. I'm going to tell you a quick story before these guys come. My stories always come to mind as they're already in the front, so I'm going to give them give them a break tonight. I was praying about uh, my professorship at Landmark, and um, I had talked to the faculty or the president a few weeks ago, and I said, I just don't know if I can come back next year. And it is, it's, uh, it's a little difficult, and, but it's just in my heart. It's really in my heart, so I was burdened about it. And I thought, well, maybe they'll let me come every other week. So I called them yesterday, and uh, I said, let me tell you what I'm praying about here. In one of my classes, think about this, in one of my classes, I have students from six countries around the world. Six. Now, you know, how could I ever go there and speak to those people and affect all those churches? I can do it in one classroom, one day a week. So I, I called them. I said, look, is there a way we can work this out that I can come one week and then teach from here using technology on the, on the off week? And he said, you know, uh, I haven't had peace, any peace, about finding somebody to take your place. And uh, he said, we just had a pastor return from the Ukraine that had a group of pastors in a Bible college who needed teachers and curriculum. And what we've done is we've, we've already agreed with them that we're going to live stream classes from Landmark at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock. That will be 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock p.m., in the Ukraine. And so I was just absolutely thrilled about that. And I can do it from here when I can't get down there. And it saves me a little time and um, gives me a little, little more rest on the off week. But I was so excited about that. So excited about that. And uh, boy, when you get missions in your heart, it just becomes the mission. Everything you do just uh, ought to feed that mission. And so our faith promise giving is the giving part. There's the praying part, the giving part, and the going part. Somebody has to go. And so through our giving, we support those who have gone and are trying to go and to be a blessing, tremendous blessing to them. Maybe on Sunday night, uh, I had the privilege on Monday uh, after uh, Sunday night to be able to send out emails and text messages to our friends that we've accepted as our new missionaries to let them know that you have a new partner and uh, it was just exciting, just exciting to see their responses coming back in. And, and uh, one of them said, you'll never know the timing of this. God is good. And uh, I'm just so encouraged about that. And I appreciate you in your giving. So ushers, will you come? We'll receive uh, the offering tonight. Through our tithe, we support our local church. And through our faith promise, we support local churches and helps ministries uh, literally all around the world. And uh, thank God for his goodness to us. We're going to pray. And then get right into God's Word tonight. A good lesson from the book of Ezra in chapter number 8. I think that you'll find some things here that will be very pertinent to our Christian life. But let's pray and ask God's blessing on the offering tonight. Brother Tyler, will you lead us in prayer, please?
chapter 8. Do you have your Bible there? Ezra chapter 8. We are uh, basically this lesson and two more from the end of the book of Ezra, and that would be the first six months of the year. Uh, compared to the breakneck speed of our last two years series, it does seem like we're in a bit of a spiritual crawl uh, getting through these, uh, these two books in God's Word, Ezra and, of course, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, but I was looking forward to just taking a little bit of extra time, uh, maybe even dividing chapters up, looking in God's Word and in greater detail. We're going to get through an entire chapter here tonight. So within uh, three weeks will be the book of Nehemiah. And to be real honest with you, uh, what God used to bring me to this theme for the year was Nehemiah. And uh, then, of course, I saw how Ezra played such a crucial part in that. And so there are some really awesome truths that lie ahead for us in the book of Nehemiah that will be beginning to uh, open the door to those here in the next few weeks. But uh, let's allow Ezra uh, his time in the spiritual spotlight. I don't think uh, in a lot of pulpits uh, around America and a lot of Bible reading schedules, we really spend a lot of time with Ezra. I really don't. Uh, there is some flyover country in the Bible, and uh, like a political candidate that never visits certain places. And, and, and certain the Bible reader, the average reader, doesn't really give a lot of attention to uh, the ministry of Ezra. Uh, but we have come to appreciate the scribe, the ready scribe of Moses. Look, if you will, we're not going to read uh, the first uh, 14 verses. For the sake of the genealogy, I'll encapsulate it quickly here in just a moment. The scripture says in verse 15, And I gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahava. And there abode we in tents three days, and I viewed the people and the priest, and found there none of the sons of Levi. Now they're... They're making their trip. They're on the journey. And he inspects this crowd. And Ezra said there were no sons of Levi, Levites, that would be involved in the temple sacrifices and the worship when we get to Jerusalem. He was troubled by that. And he sent for Eliezer, for Ariel, for Shemaiah, for Elnathan, for Jerob, and for Elnathan, and for Nathan, and for Zechariah, and for Meshulam, chief men, also for Joyarib and for Elnathan, men of understanding. You see, chief men and men of understanding. And sent them with commandment unto Edo, the chief at the palace or place at Cassiphia. And I told them what they should say unto Edo and to his brethren the Nethanims, and at the place Cassiphia, that they should bring unto us ministers for the house of our God. Here it is again. And by the good hand of our God upon us. They brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Malai, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah with his sons and his brethren 18, and Hashabiah with him, Jeshiah, the sons of Merari, his brethren and their sons 20. Also of the Nethanims, whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanims, all of them were expressed by name. Verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones, and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this. And he was entreated of us. I want you to circle verse 21. I proclaimed a fast at the river of Ahava. The river of Ahava. Did you know that all of us spend at times in our lives moments at the river of Ahava? 
between Persia and Palestine, between where faith is born and where faith brings forth that child. Persia is the place where God plants the seed. The land of Israel is where we see God give the increase. Someone said years ago, and I think it's true, it doesn't matter how you start, it's how you finish. People always remember how you finish. And here is Ezra at the river of Ahava between two opinions. The title of the lesson tonight is The Journey of a Lifetime. The Journey of a Lifetime. You know as well as I do that life is not about the destination. It's really all about the journey. There's a great verse in Joshua, Joshua's journey. Joshua, as opposed to Moses, would enjoy the destination. Moses didn't get to see it. He was taken atop Mount Nebo. His eyes could see afar off the land of Israel, but his feet would never splash in the waters of the Jordan, never enjoy the pomegranates of the land, of the milk and honey. But Joshua would. And he said, Joshua 1.15, Until the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them, then you shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's what the Christian life is all about, enjoying the journey. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I'm going to enjoy the destination. Amen? I mean, there's no doubt about that. Paul said to depart and be with Christ is far better. But for to me, to live is Christ. I'm enjoying the journey. Because the journey is not about geographical things. It's about a person. And the journey, his name is Jesus Christ. Now, although there is no scriptural mention of the happenings in Abraham's life in his pilgrimage of Canaan, there's no information in the Bible about what was going on through Joseph's mind as he was riding down to Egypt in an Ishmaelite caravan. The Bible doesn't give us any information about Elimelech and Naomi's conversations that they had when they had left the house of bread to find bread in the land of Moab. But there is great information regarding the happenings of the wilderness wanderings of Israel under the leadership of Moses. And God allows men like Moses and Ezra to become very personal in their telling of the events of their pilgrimages. In other words, Moses writes in first-hand, very personal ways regarding the happenings in the wilderness for those 40 years. And, and even here in chapter number 8, we could read chapter 7 and get the gist of the story. Ezra took a second group of people to the land of Jerusalem, open up chapter 9 and find out what he perceived when he got there. But God allows he and Moses to share with us some of the happenings that took place along the journey. Notice at the end of chapter number 7, I don't know if it's a thing of note to you, but it meant a lot to me. For we came through the first uh, almost seven chapters, and it was, it was very stale, historical, I should say, information. But then he says, notice chapter 7, verse 28. Uh, this is Ezra speaking, and hath extended mercy unto me. Now that's, that's the first personal pronoun we found in the whole book. Oh, Martin Luther said the power of Christianity is found in the personal pronoun. Me. <laughs> Jesus is my Lord. He's my God. We changed our choir opener for Sunday instead of saying Jesus Christ the Lord to Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Because it's, it's personal. He's not just a Savior. He, he's my Savior. Amen? And He's my Lord, as Thomas said, and, and He's my God. And so he gets very personal here in telling about the story uh, in, about the journey. Now, in fact, so many of our stories and our lives are about the journey, not the destination itself. Matter of fact, when we tell about a vacation we and our families took, how much of our storytelling is not about what we saw when we got there, but about things that took place along the journey? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Enjoy the journey. I told someone earlier today that we have four children and our oldest is a teenager now and I'm not looking forward to having three teenagers at the same time. I'm just not looking forward to that. 
But the fact of the matter is, God reminds me of this often. Uh, just take time to enjoy the journey. Just enjoy the journey. He's allowed to be authentic and transparent in regards to this journey of faith. Now, this was no mean or average or ordinary journey. This was a great, great trip of consequence. It was a 900-mile journey from the land of Persia to the land of Canaan. And what's interesting, if you look at a map from where he comes to the river of Ahava, where they think the river is, we discover that he took the same journey that Abraham took out of the Fertile Crescent between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. He takes the same journey that his great, 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 great ancestor Abraham, 1,500 years before, took. And, and he left the land of, of Haran looking for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. No wonder a Jew spoke of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He wanted that God to be real in his life as well. Down into Canaan they would come. We know from history and even what is inferred here in our chapter, there were marauders and criminals who sought to, to lie in wait along the entire journey to, to uh, steal and rob and plunder the goods of those who carried themselves through the desert. And we would also know, if you have children, you'll appreciate this, or even a wife. Because of the women and children in the group, it would be a slow crawl to the land of Canaan. This was a great, great journey. And I want you to notice in our text tonight three things about the journey. And they are so typical of our lives, at least in the first two points, and maybe not so much in the third, but that's why God speaks to us about it. Number one, I want you to notice it was a journey of faith. It was a journey of faith. Ezra is on a journey of faith, depending fully, totally, wholly upon his God. Now, what did he have with him in his journey to the land of Canaan? First of all, I want you to notice he had people, or they are those who are with us on the journey. Now, I believe the Bible teaches that no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. In other words, nobody makes the journey of a lifetime. Nobody goes through life without affecting others around them. There are people that were with them. Now, in the first 14 verses, we won't take time to do all the math, but we find 1,496 men accounted in these 14 verses. And so it's been extrapolated out. If they were married and had children, this was a crowd of at least 6,000 Jews. Then there was a second group of people, and I want you to notice their little name, verse 21, to seek of God a right way for us, and maybe circle this in your Bible, and for our little ones, our little ones. Now, if God has blessed you with children along the journey of faith, you've had some precious, precious cargo in the journey of faith, and God calls them little ones. Now, taking the little ones, think about this for a moment, taking the little ones meant that those who were making the journey were all in to this journey of faith. Like Moses in Egypt, where Moses says to Pharaoh, we're taking the women, we're taking the children, we're taking the cattle. Brother, if I have my wife and my children with me, it means I'm all in. I'm all in. We're not going without our children. We're all in. Can I just say tonight that the work of God must be a whole family work. Boy, we, we have to be all in. In all thy doing, don't leave the little ones behind. I heard the saddest story I think I've heard in my life last night. Just a sad story. We were talking to a lady affiliated with the soccer team that Ethan's a part of, and we found out last week this this lady was raised on the mission field. Her family were missionaries to Thailand. And not to violate the mission group or the denomination that they were with. But the denomination had a rule back in those days that all of the children of the missionaries in all of, all of Asia, they were not allowed to educate their children. And so there was a uh, boarding school for mission children. So at the age of six, this little girl took a six-hour... Uh, a drive or trip to a train, 24 hours on the train, and one adult supervisor who would take all these children on a six-hour airline flight to go to this school in Asia. 
So basically, they, they were reared without uh, the love of mom and dad. They were home for a few weeks at Christmas time. And we obviously would, would know the consequence of that. Children were raised without developing a real bond between their mom and dad. They had a problem because there weren't second generation missionaries desiring to be involved in the work and even the natives could not see missionaries and children communicating and fellowshipping together, proving what Christian families really live like and, and how they work together. I'm simply saying in the journey of faith and in the work of God, we ought to always make sure we don't leave the little ones behind. Sometimes God tells me, you know, you ought to just go home, just be home. That's hard to do. But you have to do that. Billy Sunday had preached to millions and led millions to Christ. And the thing that Billy Sunday was so against was, was liquor. And I think two of his sons were alcoholics who died outside the influence of their dad. Brother, we ought to take the little ones with us. There's some... Tender verses in Genesis chapter 45, verse 19. These are the words of Joseph to his brethren. Now thou art commanded, this do ye. Take ye wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, Joseph says to his family. For your wives and bring your father and come. And then he says in Genesis 50, verse 21. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. How tender Joseph says that. I'll take care of your children, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. This was not a journey of instant gratification, microwave Christianity. No, this, this was a delayed gratification trip. The seeds that Ezra was to plant were not those which would grow in his lifetime. But as he planted the seed of God's word and fulfilled God's work in the land of Israel, God would in time give the abundant Increase. He took the men, he took the little ones. And then notice number three, beginning in verse 15, he's looking for the sons of Levi. He's looking for these ministers who can invest their lives in the appropriate and proper and biblical work of God. Now, I was going to use this verse later, but look, if you will, in chapter 10 and verse 3. Now, when his, when his sacred feet, and how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. When that old preacher, that scribe, when he hit... Jerusalem soil, he took out his leather lined Bible and he began to preach the Word of God. And what is he trying to do? We look at the issues he dealt with, but what is he trying to do? Verse 3, chapter 10. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. I love that. I love that. He says, we need to do according to the law. What law? The law of God. We need, he said, to get back to living a biblical life. Now, what was the problem with pre-captivity Israel? Well, they weren't doing God's work God's way. And he needs these helpers in the work to accomplish this task. He makes this startling discovery. Verse 15. There abode we in tents three days, and I viewed the people and the priest and found there none of the sons of Levi. How could he reinforce and reform the work of God without servants in the temple? Gathering here the chief and understanding men he consulted with them to speak to Ido. Notice very carefully, if you, you got to read between the lines just a little bit here. Sometimes what you read between the lines is far more interesting than what you read on the lines. That's a joke. <laughs> but you have to read your Bible with some imagination from time to time. Verse, verse 17. And to his brethren the Nethanims at the place of Casaphia, they should bring unto us ministers for the house of our God. What, what seems to be taking place here is that this Ido was the president of a school for the sons of Levi. I've called it Casaphia Baptist College. And they were training men for the work of God. Now notice carefully, 
the young men were there. They were qualified. They were sons of Levi. They were trained to do the work of the sons of Levi. And they were willing to do the work of the sons of Levi. But what were they doing? They were waiting for somebody to come and commission them and recruit them to do what God had given them to do. What a miracle it was when, verse 18, Ezra says, the hand of our God, the hand of our good God, the good hand of our God was upon us. And they brought this man of understanding and and his sons and they reinforced the work of God. This journey of faith awaited the temple servants. Now we learned in chapter 7 that there was tax exemption from Artaxerxes for these preachers. An opportunity to serve. The only thing holding them back from doing the work of God was somebody saying, hey, there's a great work that we're trying to do and we need your help. So they had people. And then think of this. Think of the possessions that they took along the journey of faith. What are we taking with us? Well, the journey entailed precious cargo, carrying both their own belongings and the treasures for the temple. They had to make the journey with careful passage. We learn from the text, they took 100 talents of gold, 650 talents of silver, 100 talents of silver articles, 20 golden basins, and two bronze vessels. There was much that they took along the journey of faith. And then, what is the purpose of the journey of faith? Why are we going on this journey? Along the journey of the Christian life, we ought not to forget the why. You see, the why matters because the who matters. If you were to go to Landmark Baptist College with me or Crown College where my wife and I were trained to serve the Lord, you you learn a lot of what's and how's. What's and how's. And you sit in a classroom and you wonder about all the what's and the how's. And long after the varnish of the what's and the how's has long, long one off. Long one off. There's one thing that keeps you doing what you're doing. Come to learn and you have to come to learn the why. And the why is a who. You do what you do because you love Jesus Christ, because He's worthy of our praise. And He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of everything we have. The why matters because Jesus matters. And what they desired to do was to revitalize God's work, to reform spiritual worship in the land of Israel. It was for God's cause and for the cause of His work they embarked on this journey of faith. Number one, it was a journey of faith. But as I told you, we all have our river of Ahava experiences in life because nine days in, in verse 21, nine days in, there was a fear that set in. A fear. Nine days into the journey, the consequence and seriousness of the journey assaulted Ezra's soul. If you've ever set out to do anything for God, I'll tell you what will happen. Satan will show up, the discourager of the brethren, or even your own conscience, your own self, will tell you all the reasons it can't be done. And you start looking at the wilderness and stop remembering that it's all about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Boy, I'm glad if he's the author and the finisher of our faith, that tells me that he's right in the middle with us every step of the way. But we sometimes forget that. With the royal charge for all the people and all the possessions and all the purposes of God, a sense of import of failure gripped Ezra's soul. Hear me carefully. It was not the audience of the Persian potentate that struck fear in Ezra's bosom. It was not the task of Canaan that troubled him. It was the journey that troubled him. The countless things along the way that could could possibly go wrong, or as the commercial for the life insurance company says, for all the what-ifs of life. Has fear ever gripped and ripped at your soul? What if? Why well, tell you, what if will keep you up late at night, won't it? What if? Listen, I tell you, there's one reality in my life. There's one reality. Everything that the devil persuades you can't happen may not happen, but there's one reality in your life. 
It's the ever-abiding presence of Jesus Christ. That's the only absolute in your life. Absolutely. He is always, 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 always with us. Now there's always a problem. We know that. But the problem can become the turning point to go back to Persia or the turning point of going forward in this journey of faith. I wrote here in the notes, we often foolishly expect for Satan to provide a safe and smooth passage to do the work of God. But that's not so. To cross that river, to cross that river, must have been a point of no return for Ezra. He understands something. He understands that when we take these 6,000 souls and all of these little ones, sometimes what keeps people back is what might happen to their children. Sometimes the possessions keep us back from doing what we're supposed to do. Sometimes we question the purpose. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to cross the river to do what God has called us to do? That which he planted in Persia in faith now hangs in the balances of fear by the river of Elah. I was reading the inspirational words of George Patton, that great American general. During World War II, a military governor met with Patton in Sicily. When he praised Patton highly for his courage and bravery, the general replied, Sir, I'm not a brave man. The truth is, I'm an utter, craven coward. I've never been within the sound of a gunshot or in the sight of battle in my whole life that I wasn't so scared that I had the sweat in the palms of my hands. Years later, when Patton's autobiography was published, it contained this significant statement by the general. He said, I quote, I learned very early in my life never to take counsel of my fears. And then he said later, I want you to get this, courage is fear holding on a minute longer. Amen. Courage is fear holding on a minute longer. Satan said, what if? What if your company falls in the hands of the marauders and faith cried out, what if God gives us victory over those marauders? Satan said, well, what if some of them perish in the wilderness? And faith rose up and said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, I, I've known people and you've met them who are not on the journey of faith, they're on the journey of fear. A brother... There's a high holy God in heaven and His name is the Almighty God. He's not the co-pilot. No, he's, he's in charge. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? We can trust Him. And so, the journey of fear and the journey of faith became a third thing. That's why I said our experience is normally the first two and very seldom the third because... Ezra's journey became, number three, a journey of fasting. Fasting. I want you to read verse 21 again. Then I proclaimed to fast there at the river of Ahavah that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the, in the way because... We had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. In haste, in haste to begin the journey, Ezra declared the true condition of his heart to Artaxerxes the king. Watch. There was a fear of God, a faith in God, in Ezra's heart that spoke the truest meanings, the true reflection of his heart. You can always hear when somebody's not talking in faith. But you can hear when they are talking in faith. And what did he say to the king in faith? He told us in verse 22, I said unto the king, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. That's what I said. And I told him that God's power and God's wrath is against them that forsake him. That's what I told him. 
And here, he's, here he is. He had the right to ask Artaxerxes for a military entourage of protection on the journey to the land of Israel. He had the right to do that. Others had done that. But others had not made the claim that Ezra made. For he made a claim that if God be for us, there's nobody out there in that wilderness that could be against us. He made the claim that there is no hand that can rise up against us that is more powerful than the good hand of God that is upon us. And it says, notice in verse 22, will you mark the word? I was ashamed. I was ashamed. You know, we as Christians ought to be ashamed how we talk about our problems. We ought to be ashamed of who we turn to in our times of our problems. The old song said, tell it to Jesus. We sometimes tell him last after we've, to- after we've told our father and our mother and our friend and everybody that can't fix the problem. And then we tell it to Jesus alone. We ought to be ashamed of that. He said, I, I would be so ashamed to tell the king that I needed his hand of protection upon us. Well, if he's not going to ask protection from the king and he's not going to turn back, what's he going to do? The Bible says he proclaimed a fast. Verse 21. I read this, I love it. I hope it becomes part of me. Someone has called fasting a theology of priorities. A theology of priorities. The classic passage on fasting is found in Isaiah's Gospel, chapter 58, where it says in verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free? That you break every yoke. Someone said the enemy of the Christian is not the apple of poison, but apple pie. Meaning, the thing that keeps us from spiritual power is just our indulgence in everyday needs rather than saying to God, you are my greatest need. Now, very quickly, there's four types of fast in the Bible. There is, first of all, the regular fast. You can read about these. I gave you verses for them. Luke chapter 4 and verse 2, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. This is fasting from food, but drinking of water. The regular fast. That's the fast of this chapter. Then there's the partial fast. Daniel chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It's fasting from certain foods. In Daniel's case in, in, in the 10th chapter of his letter, uh, it was fasting from choice foods and lotions or perfumes, the things that would care for this natural body to give himself for spiritual power in a supernatural sense. And then you read at the base of Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, and again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, there was a sexual fast or abstinence for a season in our marriage union to give ourselves to the power of God. Then there is the absolute fast. No food or water. There's several of them in the Bible. There was the fast of Saul after his conversion in Acts chapter 9, verse 9. And Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, a fast that lasted just a, just a number of days, an absolute fast, just a number of days. But did you know Moses went 40 days and 40 nights without bread or water? Deuteronomy 9, verse 9, When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord had made with you, then I abode in the mountain forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. Andrew Murray said, Prayer is reaching out after the unseen. Fasting is letting go of all that is seen and temporal. Fasting helps express, deepen, and confirm the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything, even ourselves, to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. Now get this. Fasting freed their faith from the captivity of fear. Do you have it there in your notes? Can you read it with me? Fasting freed their faith from the captivity of fear. And look what God 
did. Look what God did. We started the chapter in faith. We went through the rivers of fear. And what happened? I love how God's Word does this. Look at verse 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go into Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He said, Lo, I'm with you always. But we're shocked when he was. I mean, he said he'd never leave us or forsake us, and we're shocked when he doesn't. We sing standing on the promises. We're, we're, hardly, we're ho hardly holding on to them. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. And we came to Jerusalem and abode there three days. Just boom. There it is. We left. God was with us. We made it. Well, you're right near margin. It was a four-month journey lived day by day. That's faith. That's faith. He encapsulated the four-month, 900-mile journey this way. Four months lived day by day. Now, God had a visible way of teaching that truth to His people in the wilderness where He said, I want you to go out of a morning and I want you to grab the manna off the ground and take as much as you can eat today. What did He teach them? Give us this day our daily bread. Faith, day by day. Now, I've got three concluding statements and I'll be done. And all God's people said, watch it. Watch it. Number one, if your first amen in a meeting is when the pastor says he's coming to a close, you've been put on the naughty list for Christmas. Number one, faith produced their full dependency upon the Lord. Now, can we be honest? Do we really want to live that way? The fact is, I don't think we really do want to live that way. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. It sent a message. It sent a message. Sometimes you've got to stop on the journey and say, Hey, wait a minute. I know, I know we've got the promise of the Bible. I know that. I know God said He'd be with us. I know that. But we need some kind of reminder here. We, we need to stop here for a second and just remind ourselves. We really, really, really do need Jesus. We really need Him. That fellow was asked about the great song, Day by Day and With Each Passing Moment. How do you feel about that song, Day by Day? He said, well, I like it. But he was convicted about it. And so he took pen in hand and he wrote, I need thee every hour. The fellow heard that song and said, well, I like that one. He said, but uh, moment by moment I'm kept in his care. We get smaller and smaller and smaller in our need of him and our dependency upon him. Faith pronounces our dependence upon God. Number two, faith paved the way for others to do God's work. This was the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes. We open up Nehemiah's letter. Nehemiah chapter 1, it was the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. In other words, your journey of faith will pave the way for somebody down the line to do what God has called them to do. Think about that. What are you doing for others coming behind you? What are you doing today to pave the way for somebody who's coming behind you? Everybody wants to be Jesus. Now, understand the illustration. Everybody wants to be Jesus, but nobody wants to be John the Baptist. What are you? I'm just a way maker. I'm just a way preparer. I'm just here to live my life for somebody else. Everybody wants to be the Paul. But nobody wants to be Ananias or Barnabas who come in to that little room where Paul, after his conversion, is still facing blindness with scales on his eyes. And Ananias comes in, puts his hands on Paul, 
greets him as a brother and as a Christian. Listen, our life ought to matter for eternity by paving the way for others coming in behind us to do a work for God. Number three, those who lived by sight were benefited by those who lived by faith. There was a generation coming along who would see it. But they were preceded by a generation whose faith was but the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The journey of a lifetime. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. And brother and sister, as you and I are on our journey tonight, Let's enjoy His presence. Brother Polly was here recently. One of our men was complimenting Brother Polly's ministry. You ought to check Brother Polly out if you can. He does a daily podcast and articles and all that kind of thing. And here's the title of it. Enjoying the Journey. And I can tell you, I know a lot of Christians and... I don't know of anybody who enjoys it as much as he does. He enjoys the journey. We can enjoy the journey. Not by fear, but by faith. Looking unto Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray, may we? I wonder tonight if you are by the river. You're by the river. And you're looking out. There's a lot of progress already behind you. There's a wilderness in front of you. and There are obstacles in front of you. You worry about the little ones. You worry about the stuff, the things. And God says, there is certainly a principle of fasting here, but there's, there's a greater idea that God is expressing here, that is to live in absolute dependency, surrender to God. Are we willing to take that journey? Lord, I am yours and you are mine. And I trust you now. I trust you now with my life. Lord, I trust you now with all of my, all of my people, my, my wife, my children, those that I love. I trust you with my possessions. Lord, I trust you with my purposes. May your good hand be upon me on my family, on my children. Lord, as we make the journey, help us not to leave those little ones behind. Teach us, Lord, to to fast and pray, to declare to heaven our utter dependency upon God. Lord, bring us to that place and thank you for them. Thank you, Lord, that you send us messages throughout our lives that we are not alone and we cannot live alone. We're not sufficient for our lives, but in Christ, we find all that we need. Guide us and guard us and direct us, Lord. Make your face to shine upon us as you direct our paths. And we thank you and praise you for our salvation. Those of us who have come to know thee by faith, that you've revealed yourself through your word to us, and your words revealed your purpose to us. Help us to walk in obedience. We praise you and thank you. We ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand.